everybody, this is Craig with You Are Comped with another Comp Travel interview. This one I'm really excited about is with Brent Weiss, president of Money Suit Industries. Brent, so much for thanks so much for being here. Yeah, I appreciate you for having me on, Craig. Thanks. So this is I, I'm glad I found you because this is a topic I've been interested in for a long time about how new games come into the casino. So with, with that, why don't you tell me about Money Suit and what you guys do? Yeah, well, Money Suit Industries is effectively my company, and what we primarily do is just develop brick-and-mortar table game content. Um, we do work with some online distributors and so forth, but primarily I like to deal with brick-and-mortar. And effectively what we do on our end is we develop the games, obviously go through the patent process, everything to protect the intellectual property, and then you go through the sales process, of course, you know, pitching it to casinos and whatever facilities, trying to show them the worth of the product, bring it in. And then if they bite, then you're going to be the ones to go out and train, deal with the licensing approvals, train the staff, train the players, and then just babysit the game and make sure it all goes appropriately for the most part. So in a nutshell, that's a table games development company. So how did you get into this business? Yeah, so it's actually kind of a funny story with me. I'm not from gaming at all, completely an outsider. I grew up playing cards maybe a little more than I should have, going to casinos maybe a little more. And I grew up playing a game called 31 with my friends that after being in facilities, I had never seen it in table games form. And that's what kind of made me think, like, why has this never been done before, which kind of kickstarted me off and brought me into the industry to start developing games. And that's kind of what hooked me into the industry versus what normal people are like dealers or floor staff or somebody in the business that sees a, a void that wants to fill it. I was very different. I just grew up playing a game, never saw it in table games and kind of roped me into this 12 year process later. And here I am. So, so it started out, you were kind of scratching your own itch. You were playing a game that you knew was fun. You played with friends, never saw it in a casino. And so you, so essentially the business grew out of you trying to get this game into a casino. Yeah, effectively one single game. Back then it was one game, one concept. It was like a family style game, like Go Fish, that we would play together with some buddies. And I was like, don't understand why this wouldn't work in table game form. And I didn't know what I was doing back then. So I tried to learn how to develop a game. And the first one was very inappropriate for live play, honestly. Um, but you got to start somewhere and learn. So that's that's how it started for me. I'm like, I like this game. Why wouldn't it work in table game form? So let's, let's give it a shot. And I wish I knew a little bit more back then. But, you know, you got to start somewhere. <laughs> so then, so today, how much is it you coming up with games and trying to take them to market or – are you finding people that have game ideas and you help them? With it's a kind of a combination of both. I mean, myself personally with the games I distribute, those are all mine. Um, I do help a lot of uh, novice and semi farther along developers kind of fine tune certain things with that. Cause which we'll get into a little later markets are very different. So it's very confusing on our end of things as far as licensing and approval goes. Um, but I primarily market and sell my own games, but there are some people that come to me and I will happily help them if they need a distributor in certain jurisdictions, of course, that I'm licensed in, but I'll do the gamut, but primarily I'll work on my own. I'll even work with some of the bigger companies like Psy Games or Galaxy. I'm you know, working out some products. And actually in the past, I was licensed out to DEQ when they were still in business before they got consumed by Valley Tech and Psy Games. So I kind of covered the whole gamut from novice to uh, the big boys out there effectively with who I work with so and so you told us a little bit about your first game what did you say it was 31 that was called yeah, Mon money suit 31 was the first game I ever uh, created hence the company named money suit industries if that gives that away so okay so money suit 31 um, yeah I want to either use that as an example or another one but tell us what what's that first stage like of taking going from an idea to something that you can actually start to protect and sell. Okay. So like you had said, the biggest thing, like you said, is you have to have like a hook or a reason for a game to be popular effectively. So when you have that a game in your head where you're like, well, how will this really work? And you have to think, well, why would people play this game versus other games on the floor, like three card or four card or things like that. The first step you have to do is of course, make the math work. So usually what will happen is, is you want to, find somebody that you either trust their math, usually it's computer scientists because some of these programs have to be pretty vast to figure out all the combinations. But you wanna fine tune the math on a game first, make sure it works. And um, it's not always just making the math work in a general sense. You know, things that you need to kind of look into is a return per event, things like that, to make sure that people aren't just gonna be dumping tons of money and then one person is gonna win a big jackpot. So the best example there is like a lottery. You know, it's great to win $25 million, but we all know that only one person is going to hit that. So everybody else is going to lose. And most likely a lot of those people, if we're dealing with table games, aren't coming back so quick to that game if they never see a win. 
So the first things first is making the math correct, you know, making sure you have a, somebody do the calculations for you before you go somebody to, you know, before you go to a GLI or BNM to get the official reports for the jurisdictional approvals and so forth. And then you, of course, you know, need to make sure you have a catchy name, whether you're going to tailor that name to just be something catchy that you think people are going to like, or if you're going to target a specific market of players, like let's say you're going after a pie gout clientele, you're going to want to maybe have an Asian style theme or something with dragon in the title that will kind of lure people into, wait, I understand that it sounds like pie gout, so maybe I'll look into it a little more and actually give you a hook to maybe lure them over to the table to at least take a look at it. That's, that's really interesting. So I, I like, I like that. So you think, that's something I hadn't thought of prior to this. So you think of a game that would be kind of the platform that you would peel players from, whether it be blackjack or pie gal or something, you try to relate it to a table game and maybe that's the initial customers that pull them off that table. Two or three, not even necessarily pulling them off, but it's like, we have to have a market we're tailoring to. Like we all know, and even what early on with me is when you create a game, you think it's the greatest game ever, right? It could be the worst game in history, but you're going to think it's your baby. I'm going to make a billion dollars off this, right? There's no issues. But you have to realize you have to sell this to somebody, right? So if I'm coming to you with something you've never heard of, well, let's say I know that Craig likes Blackjack or likes Baccarat. I might create a game and market it and tailor it to like those clientele where I'm going to have a Baccarat game. So why don't I have like a player 27? I'm just making up a name here so that players see it and like player 27, it sounds like it can be Baccarat. So maybe I'll check that out opposed to just walking on by. So it gives you a reason to at least look into it to see if it's something you want to you know, place a bet on and see if it's entertaining and so on, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. No, it makes sense. So, so the first stage, it's idea, it's sweat equity. It sounds like there could be some cost to doing the math, hiring somebody real smart to do the math. Is that generally expensive or? Um, it really depends on who you find. I mean, I've been lucky um, to find some mathematicians or computer scientists that do it pretty cheap for me. That's not always the norm, to be honest with you. But for the preliminary math, if you're just getting a spreadsheet done from somebody, and I actually said this a few times in other interviews, I use people like Charles Mousseau at Total Gaming Science, where he'll do the probabilities. And like I said, then we have to tailor them to make it somewhat appropriate. You can usually get math done. I'm not quoting anybody here, obviously, mm -hmm. to price their services because it's not mine. But um, you can probably get the preliminary math done for anywhere from a couple hundred dollars to like a thousand bucks just to get their preliminary stuff done so you can then tailor it. And then before you actually launch the game, you're then going to need to move on to like a BMM or GLI. And depending upon the game and the complexity, it could run you anywhere from like two grand to 10 to 15,000, depending on how crazy it is and how pay tables. It's usually not that that expensive, but if you have a really crazy blackjack game or a blackjack sideways or that affects the underlying strategy to blackjack with all these different shoe games and things like that, it's going to be rather complex for them to do all those math number crunching and so forth. So you have to expect for that to be a little pricey. But if you're going for BM, BMM or GLI, you'll probably have a facility that's installing the game. So you'll probably spend the money to give it a shot because you can make a lot of money in this business. But I wouldn't say it's advisable to do that right away because you have to change math often in this business. You've got to learn on the fly and see what people like and hear feedback in order to make appropriate changes. And then the last thing that you kind of need in the preliminary concept phase is you, of course, need a good logo. So usually before I launch a game or get feedback, I'll have the preliminary math done with my pay table, but I also want to have a good logo so I can put a, you know, a layout together. So it's not just like I'm presenting you a theory where I'm like, this sounds like a great game, right? What do you think? And you're like, I have no idea. I can't see anything. I just hear all these numbers and these payouts that you're telling me that. So preliminarily, those are the two most important things to get done, which is a low well math. And then you could work from there on procedures and literature and so forth, which we'll get into a little bit later. Okay. That's really interesting. So it starts out with an idea that's free, sketch it out, then you do the math, which can cost a little bit depending on the, on the complexity and you pay to get a logo. Then the next step, you have something that you want to start selling. You don't want some, to pitch somebody and they're like great idea and they steal it so you have to protect it so what's what's that process like so the protection process is a little complicated obviously you know there's all sorts of different levels of intellectual property so there's three different things that you'll probably want to do on the side of a table game developer and one of which which i'll save to the end the patent stuff is a little complex and it makes people's heads spin a little bit because there's some interesting things going on there but First, which is the cheapest and easiest, I'm a big fan of copywriting all of my uh, literature and so forth, like my manuals, my game rules. It doesn't really afford you tons of uh, protection, but in the event somebody rips off a game like you had alluded to before, and it's the exact same game, if I have my game manual, manual my game rules copywritten, and they have to submit all the stuff to gaming and the distributing literature to buyers, it might be directly infringing upon your copyrights. 
So that's what I like to do. Again, it doesn't afford you tons of protection. It's not super expensive, but it's something. And it also gives you that timestamp to show when the concept that started. And then when we're talking branding and things, which is one of the most important aspects of this business with game names like Three Car Poker, everybody knows that. You're talking Ultimate Texas Hold'em, everyone pretty much knows that. You're going to want to trademark the name. So the trademark process is usually around, uh, I'd say like a year and a half or so is when you'll know if the trademark is going to push through. But that process, you have to do a whole search to make sure, of course, there's nothing similar in that realm. Because if you have an entertainment business that has pretty much the same name, you're going to ask the trademark infringement issues. So you want to avoid that, obviously, at all costs. So you usually hire an attorney. They'll do a trademark search for you. Once you have the game done, they'll issue you, you know, an opinion letter. And then if you want to press forward, they'll then file the application for you. It's nothing too crazy on price. Again, not quoting anybody here, but you could probably get trademarks done from around around. 2,000, 2,500 bucks all in, maybe. If there's office actions, which is if uh, something gets rejected and the attorney needs to say, hey, this is why it's okay, they'll have to file responses, which costs some money and so forth. But other than that, the trademark process is in that complex. But when it comes to the method now, that's when we're getting into the patent realm, which is the expensive and long process here. And when you're coming to patents, you could actually patent physical table games, the electronic versions, and now we have a lot of social and mobile stuff going online. So that's actually now built into a lot of patent claims also. And so the process there is similar to trademarks where you are going to do a patent search with your attorney, which is pretty expensive. Um, I don't want to even quote prices, just not to mm -hmm. ruffle any feathers with anybody, but that takes a little while, obviously. And then when, if everything is clear and you're, you get the opinion letter from your attorney saying, you know, we think you have a shot or you're not infringing upon things that are out there, the drafting and application process can run you anywhere from five grand to 15, depending on how complex it is, whether it's just a physical game or if you have, you know, hardware associated or any sort of, specialty mechanisms or anything of course it would get more complex and the attorney you're going to pay by hour so you would get pretty pricey and then once that's submitted pretty much nothing happens with patents for about a year to a year and a half before you get that first office action like we had talked about on trademarks and then again your attorney is going to you know draft responses try to overcome those hurdles and that process can take years from there and then you Hopefully, one day we'll get it fully protected so you have full protection on the product. Now, one little nuance there is if you're an aspiring developer and you're trying to save money, there's two types of patents out there. There's a, util there's a utility patent, which is the 17-year patent that everybody knows about, and you have the provisional. Now, the provisional patent is a very good way for people like us to go because a provisional patent is a little bit less, I'll say, scrutiny associated because the USPTO actually doesn't review it at all. You still should have an attorney do it, but you file it and it effectively gives you an annual placeholder at the USPTO. So your patent pending theoretically, where if you have a product that works and you're testing the market for that year before you jump into that huge patent cost, if you have a viable product, you get that filing date of your provisional for the utility if you transfer it over a year later. And then if you already know at that point, if your product has any legs, so it could save you $20,000 if you have kind of a crappy product and you try to sell it, nobody is hopping on board, you're probably not going to move far with the actual utility patent application and so forth. So you save yourself a little bit of money in aggravation, which is a good thing. Now, we talked before the interview started. I noticed your background has a lot of files. Yeah. And I, it's, I'm like, it's either an accountant or an attorney. So you said you're an attorney. And yeah, so do you, an attorney. <laughs> yeah, so are you doing, um, is that your area of expertise, patent copyrights or... Like, are you saving money by doing it yourself or do you have, um, you have to go to another lawyer? So it's kind of a yes, no answer is I do save money by doing it myself because I have other patents that I've been issued. So I do draft a lot myself, but as you have to be a licensed patent attorney, which I am not, it's actually like a third test you have to take when you're becoming an attorney. So I'm not involved in that realm. I do a lot of business stuff, some litigation, and we do a lot of real estate and estate work here in New York, but I'm not in the patent realm. And it's actually kind of ironic. What brought me to go to law school was when I was trying to get my first patent on money, 231 issued. There's this case called Bilski, which has destroyed everything in our industry, effectively, is the best way to say it. That was 75 pages long or so forth. And I read that. I'm like, you know what? I don't really don't hate this so much. I'm like, maybe I'm going to go to law school. And then, you know, five years later, here I am as an attorney. So it's kind of funny. That that's what actually what pushed me to become an attorney. So I'm not in patents, but that's what led me to go to law school. And my father is also an attorney, so he obviously liked the idea. So, so he wasn't objecting to that at all. So that's why I work with him actually here in New York now. So it's kind of funny. What a great story. That's awesome. So you've, uh, so you got the idea, you've protected it. Sounds like provisional patent is probably the smart um, way to go initially. Mm -hmm. Now you gotta, you gotta take it to the next step. You gotta start selling it. What do you do then? Yeah. So that's kind of a, 
different areas of that answer, I guess, is the best way. And during the whole development process, of course, you're going to have strong game literature like manuals and so forth, so that you use that as marketing materials. So over time, I've actually gone about this a whole bunch of different ways. At the very beginning, again, I had no idea who to approach, how to approach them, or what, what have you. So I'm literally cold calling operators at facilities trying to find out who the directors of table games are and hope that they would even give me the information that those people would speak to me. I even think the first two introductions I got, I literally reached out to the employment department at the Bellagio and at Caesars Entertainment, and they actually responded and gave me information. I couldn't believe that. But other times I was sending physical hard copies out with like game materials to facilities, and I think that got me my first actual demo with Foxwoods. I sent it randomly to the table games department, and one of the ship managers had read it. But these days, the that's kind of a, a done deal these days, especially with COVID. That's just not going to happen anymore. Um, so you're not going to really just show up to the facility and set up meetings. So the biggest and easiest way probably to get your games out there these days is the conventions and the table game shows. So the two biggest ones, which are both likely canceled, I mean, G2E, the Global Gaming Expo, already is. Um, and that's usually not the best one for independent table games, because it's massive. It's very expensive. But that's every single person in the world in the industry comes. So if you really want to get a product out and demo it, that's probably a good, a good place. But you have to be prepared for the expense. The place that I've gone three times in the last four years is the Cutting Edge Table Games Conference, and that's held every November in Las Vegas, and that is just effectively independent table games developers, or not independents, but all just table games content. So all the table games directors in the country are coming there, and they're coming there specifically to see new products and table games. And so if they like your game, they'll tell you. You know, they'll want you to send over information and so forth, and if they don't, they're going to tell you. <laughs> so you, you know what you need to change, but that's a great venue. But otherwise, things like LinkedIn, any sort of social media venues, uh, you know, areas that you can go down to just find the right person is really the way to go. And then otherwise, just like any sales, it's cold calls, trying to meet people, build a network, just like anything else. I mean, this is a very, I'll call it a, not niche industry, but everybody knows each other. It's very incestuous. So if you start building a network with people, you're likely, if you're credible and you're easy to work with, of course, then you're going to get kind of referrals to others. So people will at least hear you out. But these days, conventions are the best if they ever come back, thanks to COVID, of course. And um, otherwise, just cold calling LinkedIn, just trying to get games out. Just what do you think about this game? I've been trying to sell you. What do you think about it? Do you think it's good? Do you think it's bad? You can tell me the truth. Just be open-minded. One problem is, is that people do not want to hear you know, skepticism or criticism. So as a developer, you have to be open-minded. If people tell you stuff you should change, you should probably at least take it to heart and see if you can alter games a little bit that way. But regular sales, it's really the only answer, unfortunately. And so you mentioned conventions and I've, I've been to G2E a couple of times. So I've definitely seen that. I've seen how massive it is. So I can see how hard it would be to get attention at a, at a place like that. Now, without conventions in this era of Zoom, have you adapted? I mean, how are you, are you able to demonstrate gameplay via online or it's, it's pretty tough? It's, uh, I mean, luckily with me, which has been interesting, is I've had, I was one of, I think, the first early on where I have, if you see my website, I actually have some playable game demos on my website. So that's how I've been able to, at least with things like LinkedIn, get games in front of people where it's like, look, on your own time, just 30 seconds, give this game a try and let me know your thoughts. And then I also film these uh, procedure videos and demo videos, which help. And actually last week, I started doing a lot of these uh, meetings that I had to cancel in Las Vegas because here in New York, we have the travel restrictions. I can't warranty for two weeks if I travel to these places. So I had to cancel them. So I would do Zoom calls like this, where if if able, which I was, I would set my phone up on a tripod and have the layout literally on the table and I'd use my computer and then I'd do a demo as if I'm in front of you. But the best thing that I would say for people to do is if you can't afford a game demo like I have, and it's hard to find people to do them for a reasonable price, just if you can, film demonstration videos. Because demo videos are pretty much identical to the demonstration you're going to do in person. So I don't see any anything hurting you if you're just going to send somebody a four or five minute demonstration video for a game and then see if they like it. And then if there's really any interest there, then of course you could set up that in-person meeting and you're avoiding the whole expense of traveling beforehand if they see the video and like this game sucks. Sorry, we're not, a, we're not going to give this a shot. So that's, it's been a good process for me. I've been doing this slightly, but now Zoom videos seem to be helping. I mean, Zoom meetings seem to be helping. And demo videos are definitely very, very helpful as far as demoing games on the fly and virtually. Is the best. Now, are, the, are these uh, demos, um, are they on your website for anybody? Or are they behind a, a wall or something? like? No, I mean, I'm, some people do hide the content. I'm not. I'm an open book with this stuff. So my demo videos are on YouTube. You can find them all. I actually have videos posted on my website with the game demos i even have my math up there which some people do not like doing because it's easy for somebody else just to take it 
Um, but I don't hide it. Some people have like the paywall pop-up before you can get the information, but that mine's public. Anyone go on YouTube, see all the demo videos, all the everything. I'm very active. All the people that know these games are mine. That's how I kind of discreetly try to protect myself by making it publicly known that these are mine. So we'll, we'll put it in the show notes and we'll plug it at the end, but the website and YouTube, should they just search Money Suit? And, uh, it's really the game. The website is moneysuit31.com um, and you can find the game names, but then you can go on YouTube and you can search. It might even be under my name personally. If you search Brem Weiss, my videos might come up. You can search Three Card Fury demo video. You can search Money Suit 31 demo, 31 classic demo, and they should pop up. But once you find my channel, they're all there for you to watch. <laughs> Perfect. Well, hopefully we'll see some of these games in the casinos. And um, and so now Three Card Fury is one that you're uh, excited about. Now, uh, talk about the trial process. So you get somebody interested and they say, all right, let, let's give it a shot. What What's that like? Okay, so I'll try to nutshell it for you because believe it or not, like we talked about, everything is so different from place to place. So in some jurisdictions, there's a government mandated trial process and I'll use Nevada and I'll use Mississippi because they're kind of similar. So when you have a brand new game, that's not a variant of anything. And I'll use my 31 games as an example, because when they came out, there was like nothing else out there that was like it. So that's considered a new game when it comes to submissions. So in Nevada, the way that that's going to work is you're going to get your GLI letter or BMM letter with Nevada specific to submit the game. And you're going to go through the background checks and all that fun stuff. And then once everything is approved, you're going to then dictate where the trial facility is going to be, and then they're going to dictate the time frame. Now, in Nevada, the trial process is effectively anywhere from 45 to 90 days. And then once they conclude, you have to submit your reports. And obviously, the facilities are sending the math and the data in the whole time. And then at the end, once your report is submitted, if there's no issues, effectively, we'll go through the gaming commission. We'll go through their process. They'll have their board hearings, and then it will either be rejected or it will be granted. And once it's granted, then they have to go through the court process of effectively making it statute is the best way. Mississippi, some of the, I'll call lower traffic uh, faci um, facilities and jurisdictions have a little bit of a different, they're a little more lax on the finite I'll call details of the trial, where you still have to submit, you still have to get approval from the gaming commission, but it's really based on play, where it's supposed to be like 90 days, but even one of my trials lasted like several months because just the play on the floor is just super slow because it's a really small struggling facility. So that lasted a long time. And once they're satisfied with the amount of play in the sample set, they determine that it's acceptable for play in the, in the state. In Mississippi, you actually have to show up and appear in front of the commission and it's more or less state your appearance. You know, I'm here to get this game approved and they don't really ask you too many questions as long as there's no issues and then they'll effectively approve the game. Now with tribes in some other states, in some states, the facilities submit everything, not the developer, which is interesting because when you're submitting on your own, you're paying for everything. States like Indiana, and if you're dealing with the California card rooms, the facilities themselves actually submit the game to the state for approval. And then it's still a state mandated trial, but it's a little bit different again, because beauty, the beautiful thing on our end is we're not paying, which is always a nice thing, of course. And then when you're dealing with things like tribes and a bunch of other jurisdictions, there's no government mandated trial, but you're of course going to give a free trial to the facility to test it out. And you just kind of work out the terms there and then three months, four months, six months, whatever it is. And then at the end of that, then if it's going to stay on the floor, they'll start paying release fee and so forth. So it's very different from place to place, which is hard to have a conversation about, but it's something we need to know if you're getting into this business. So, so initially you need a, a property, let's take the Mississippi example, to kind of sponsor you. You're not, you're paying, it sounds like, in that jurisdiction, but they're giving you floor space and they're giving exactly. you a table. Now, at the end of it, is it possible that you, the trial goes, you're approved in the state, but the casino doesn't proceed, but now that you've cross that hurdle you can go to other casinos in the state and say like hey we already approved we just like, does that ever happen or if you it's generally like the, if the casino doesn't say we want to move forward um you're you're stuck yeah it's i haven't luckily i have not encountered a, the, the issue with the latter of that example is usually they'll stick with you unless the game's just not it's just tanking. The game's just not getting any play day four, then it's not going to make it through four months, obviously. But usually the way it will work is they'll usually stick with you. And I mean, my trial didn't pan out. It didn't stay on the floor down there after Mississippi. So this will actually pretty much answer the question. But on the operator standpoint, you have to realize when you're doing a government trial like that, there's a lot of legwork that they have. You know, they have to constantly communicate with the gaming commission. They have to make sure surveillance is reporting everything and it's readily accessible. So it's a harder pill to swallow as an operator if I'm coming to you with a formal trial 
But once the trial is done and it's approved, like my game in Mississippi 31 Classic, it's easier if I'm coming to you, Craig, like, all right, I've got this game, you know, didn't pan out on the floor in X, but, you know, it's approved, so no trial headaches for you, but I'm going to give you a trial anyway for free, and we'll see if it works. So it's an easier sell there, but then you have to explain, well, it didn't work here, so it won't work here. You know how it goes. Facilities from facilities have different clientele demographics, so you never know where a game's really going to work, unless it's a UTH and it's just going to work everywhere, effectively. Which everyone right. helps to get to. <laughs> Ultimate Texas Hold'em. Uh, what are what are some of the like home run in recent years uh, games that have come out? In recent years, I'd say like high card flush, crisscross poker are the ones that come to mind. You'll see some variants of the games like UTH, which I'll attribute to say they're still UTH. They're just from somebody else, effectively. But the newest novel games, high card flush has been doing well for a few years. Um, it doesn't seem to be losing too much traction, although some tables have been coming out from certain locations. And crisscross poker seems to have a pretty strong foothold in some places like the Northeast. I hope three card theory is next, but of course I have to toot my own, toot my own horn there. Um, but otherwise, the especially with COVID now, the one issue is is that game mixes are going to significantly change in the future. Hopefully not for long, but with all these gaming restrictions to like three tops at the table, novelty games might not survive much. You know, facilities bread and butter is blackjack, spot bra, you know, pie gal, the big games, perhaps. So they need to really optimize their floor space with those games. So you might start seeing some other novelty games coming out to make more room for these three top blackjack tables that they need to make sure that the revenue is there to support their operation and so forth. So I hope that answers the question. It, it does. Yep. And for anybody, I think you said ultimate Texas Hold'em, but for anybody that doesn't know UTH ultimate Texas Hold'em is pretty much in every casino yeah. at this point. Yeah. Um, so in the trial, what are casinos, what metrics are they really looking at for like, and not, not on the gaming commission, like, you know, is this, not what they're looking at, but the casino is this space is, are we going to take out a blackjack table to put this in? Like, what are they, what are they looking at? All right. So in, there's a couple of uh, more sophisticated metrics. We'll talk out at the end, which uh, if you've heard of Tangum systems, that's really their big thing when they're dealing with like win per open hour. But the big three that I'll call them with somebody in our perspective that we're looking for is we're looking for drop. And the drop figure is literally the amount of money bought into at the table, the amount of money dropped into the cash box. What that shows you is popularity. If people are coming in and buying in, you know they want to play the game. So that's where you get the popularity factor. Then you have the win figure. And the win is literally just the amount won by the casino. So it's pretty simple. And then the hold percentage, which is one that's kind of a debatable to topic these days, is some people think you put too much stake in a hold, which I'll get to in a second. Some think it's just not important at all. Um, and the hold percentage is just the ratio of the two. So the ratio of the win versus the you know, drop is the hold. And why that's very important in our eyes, and the operators pay close attention to that, which you recall at the beginning, we were talking about like the lottery example. Like if I have one payout, one winner every 5 million hands, they're going to win 10 million. Everybody's going to hate the game, right? So that game would probably hold incredibly high because nobody's ever hitting that top payout. So what the casino is looking at is they want to see a value for customers, of course, because we don't want just want to clean out our clientele. We want to give them value for their dollar and entertainment value. And it will let you know if people are getting wiped out a little too quickly, if there's a, maybe it's a too complex strategy where people are making wrong decisions. So we see an inflated hold, which is like, all right, we need to alter this somehow and just make sure they're not beating people up. But those are really the big three in our perspective that we're looking at. Now on the operation side also, one of the big new uh, key metrics, um, I think it's a key performance indicator that Tangum talks about all the time now is what's known as win per open hour. Because like you said, we have, think about a casino floor as real estate. Say we have just 10 tables, right? All 10 of those tables are in a property on the floor that's making us money. In order to take property seven off, I need to know that the new property is going to bring in enough, as much revenue as property seven in order to sub it out. And what they really look at is, is how much money is that table winning per hour that it's open on the floor. So we can take that number and look at our operating costs, see if it's profitable enough and see if they're making enough money for it to be a success. If that wasn't too much over the top for you. That's no, I mean, that makes total sense. And I, I'm curious too, I've noticed, and I don't know if this is something that casino tables even think about or, or is a is an advantage, but sometimes you'll walk around and you'll be like, you're looking, a player may be looking for a lower limit, right? Not necessarily players that you are comp works with, we tend to work with <laughs> bigger players, but um, you know, sometimes some people are looking for, oh, there's a $5 table and they sit down in Ultimate Texas Hold'em, it may say $5 minimum, but you're actually having to put out 15 bucks at least to do it. Is that something that casinos like as a feature, that they can put a lower 
uh, minimum bet when really it's actually a pretty expensive game. And yes, and that's actually changing things on the development side a little bit because the best example is like Let It Ride is the perfect example, right? Because Let It Ride, you put one wager down and if it's good, you're going to put some more out there maybe by the end of the hand. But UTH, like you're saying, you're starting with an ante and blind bet no matter what. And very often you're going to double or quadruple or at least single up on the play, right? So you're going to have at least three to six units out there. So the issue on the operator side is games that only have like one or two wagers out there probably aren't going to generate as much revenue as the other. They can't possibly generate as much revenue as games like ETH, where if you have a one unit wager game and, you know, it's got a house edge of 5%, just making up a number, and then you have a multi-unit game that has a house edge of 3.5, but your average bet is one unit versus four, obviously you can see how the numbers are going to fluctuate in favor of the four unit game. And not to take a step back, one of the things that's important when it comes to the development is there's two key metrics that we look at and when it comes to advantages. You have the house advantage on a game, which is just the house's edge on the ante wager, which is a good metric to look at for games like Pi Gal, because it's a single better blackjack. But then you have the element of risk and the total return to player, which is better suited for multi-wager games. So the difference between the two is house edge is just for the ante. The element of risk is the total the house is the win of the average bet per hand. So in a UTH, if you have an average bet of, let's say, like 4.2 units per, per, game, per hand, of that, if it has like a 0.7% EOR, the house is going to win X number of dollars off of all those wagers. So as far as comping purposes, which I'm sure is right up your alley, it's usually better for the novelty games to use EOR versus house edge because it's a more accurate depiction of what the theoretical loss is for that player and the theoretical win is for the facility. Excellent. No, that makes total sense it's it's deep but i love it i mean i think the, it's a uh, lot the, to throw at you but it, it makes sense <laughs> no i i think the uh the the uh, gaming like the nerds like me that that sure. like getting into theoretical and stuff really mm -hmm. appreciate that so mm -hmm. so let's say the numbers work out it's popular on the floor at the end are you brought into is it the shark tank with the gm and the vp of table games and you know it's a, a big suspenseful moment and they're offering you uh, a deal for the game or tell us about like at the end of a trial and then what negotiation the negotiations are like right, fair. and then it's funny enough a lot of that actually oftentimes happens before so there's no suspenseful thing at the end where how much are you going to pay me for this it's kind of very ironed out at first and with the new game you're not going to make that much money so <laughs> don't want to get people's hopes up there so much but the way it usually works is when you're entering into the trial some places don't want anything other than a contract for the trial itself which is fine you know, because they want to see how it does before they enter into some commitment on a license. Okay? But usually the way it's worked for me in most cases is, of course, if it's a government trial, it's just, okay, you're going to get it for the trial period. And if it survives and stays on the floor, I'm going to get $395, $295, $495 a month thereafter for a table. Um, but usually with a new game, it's kind of like standards, which how much you can really charge. We're not going to come with a new game that's, oh, past trial, give me $1,500 a month. And be like, no, get out of our facility immediately. You know, you got to at least know what the appropriate pricing is. And for new games, it's usually in that window of four to $600 a month. So you can kind of go in with that mindset of understanding that. Again, of course, different jurisdictions and markets are obviously vastly different. So if I go to a MGM grand, they're not going to be charged the same price as a little tribal facility in the middle of the forest in California. It's just not going to work. You know, they have to sustain business and make sure their overhead isn't too much in order to survive. But that's usually all done beforehand where it's like, okay, if we're not in a government trial jurisdiction like California, for instance, all right, you're going to get the game for five months free. You know, if it stays on the floor, uh, 395 a month thereafter with annual price renegotiation so that you're not locked into a contract. If you do have a UTH, you don't want to be getting 400 dollars a month for that. You want to be getting some healthy money per month if the, if the casino is making lots of money off of it. So, and so is it generally a, a fixed price per month? It's not a percentage of win? Yeah, so usually there's two ways that kind of go about it. One doesn't really happen much anymore. Some facilities back in the day used to just purchase a game outright. Like this happened with three-car poker a lot because it was expensive and it was three-car poker. It was the only thing out there where they would just play one large flat fee and they would have pretty much a, per a perpetual license to use it. Typically these days, it's just leasing fees per month. And uh, it's very unlikely that there's going to be a profit sharing situation, although it does happen online gaming very often. It doesn't happen in brick and mortar because when that happens, you also get into the whole licensing situation, obviously, as you can imagine. Now, the one interesting thing on the developer side of things is some jurisdictions require you to have licenses. Like Washington State, you need a distribution license. You need everything registered. You need to be there. Games like Nevada, where I have to go through background, I'm, I'm not required to maintain a license because I don't supply any equipment or hardware. Whereas if I would, then it would put me into a whole separate category, make it effectively cost 
ineffective to go into that market because I probably couldn't pay for the manufacturer's license and so forth. So it's kind of very different from place to place in, in that regard also. So it's, it makes people's heads spin also. For a quick example, in Washington State, I had a developer that I was helping out. And I think it was, um, I won't say the name of the game or the person, but like I actually ran into that issue in, uh, in uh, Washington. I'm like, because of, I won't say what it is, but because of X, right? They're like, that's right. I'm like, can you need the manufacturer's license. They're like, yeah, I'm like, if you were to go to Nevada and some of these other places, you can't because you're going to be paying anywhere from 20 to 100 grand for a manufacturer's license. You're not making that money back for just one table game product that's out there. So it's super complex. And I didn't know any of this when I started. You can imagine when my head started spinning when I'm like, oh, Pennsylvania, a couple thousand dollars. It might take two and a half years to get licensed and approved. That ain't going to happen because the director of table games might not be there when the game gets approved, which means the game's not going on the floor after you spend all that money and spend all that time which is another factor you have to think it's very high turnover in this business, which complicates things also. Yeah. And I, I definitely am familiar with the licensing process for our business. And uh, yeah, I mean, there's some jurisdictions we're not in for that reason. It's like, yeah. is demand there to offset to just by the cost? And like, you know, the background checks can be brutal. I mean, yeah. they're list every place you've ever lived list, like every job you've had for the last 20 years. Give us your credit card receipts. Like, what? Yeah, they, you know, might even, so, they might even show up to investigate your neighbors to ask questions about you. You never know. I've heard some stories. <laughs> yeah. So that's wild. And a question on the monthly fees. Is it, are they generally prorated? I mean, this may be kind of a fringe case, but let's say like halfway through the month, they're like, you know what, let's do one more table. Are they paying like for half the month? Or if they want to, you know, converse, they don't want to pull a table off or they only own one for half the month. It's an, interesting, it's an interesting question. Yeah, it makes sense. And honestly, I haven't encountered that issue. Um, and usually what I do, and this is not necessarily standard, is I'll just give them the two weeks for free or whatever the case may be. You know what I mean? So let's start the contract on the 15th. Go ahead and take the two weeks. I just hope you keep it on the floor for seven months. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, but usually is, I'm sure it gets prorated sometimes. Um, like you said, when putting games, extra tables in, you could probably just start the billing on that day of the month, but I just kind of like keeping my billing on a specific day. It's just on the month and I'll give them a week or two for free. But as far as pulling games off the floor, typically in contracts, you have like a termination period where it's got to give me 30 days written notice or 45 days written notice so that it kind of gives you that leeway. So it doesn't fall into that middle of the month, but I'm sure many times it comes up where it's like, all right, we're two weeks into this period. Am I paying or am I not? Me as a small guy who can deal with it, I'll probably just let that go, of course. But I'm sure like side games or any of the other big guys might not. So it's kind of probably on a specific facility by facility or person by person basis, which is probably a, another reason to work with an independent like us because we're free to make those decisions that others might not be able to make. Yeah, no, that's, that's interesting. I just remember when I worked on a cruise ship, this is ages ago, we had some big player that wanted to play Pi Gow Tiles. And all of a sudden, mm -hmm. one game turned into Pi Gow Tiles for that cruise. So maybe with um you know carnival games that's is that a derogatory term for it or that's no, that's what i call them novelty okay. carnival, whatever it is you're not gonna offend me <laughs> <All right. laughs> so um yeah so with novelty games i didn't know if that's something that happens a lot but it sounds like it's not too common they have to deal with yeah because with cruises as you're more aware than i am you know things could change pretty quickly I and mean, you're dealing with international waters you guys have pretty much free reign to do what you want with the casinos swapping tables out in certain markets i'm sure is not that quick of a process i mean maybe nevada if the game's approved it's quicker i mean i don't know but it might be quicker versus maybe washington state or pa it might be a whole process as far as because you know you're paying you know, the facilities are paying taxes per table you know per everything so it might complicate things on their end where it's not that quick whereas you can just swap out a pie gap a regular pie gap table for tiles for that one person you know that's going to sit down with 50 grand bankroll for the three-day cruise versus a so that's like we pull this out what are we going to do with seven thousand people that are going to come through the door for the next five days and want to play the game we're about to take out for this one whale yeah makes sense so you mentioned uh three card fury is that tell us about it because that sounds like that's the game that you're most excited about right now yeah, three card, Advantage Play Three Card Fury is because it actually took third place at last year's Cutting Edge Table Games Conference. The, going back to the development conversation, you always need that hook to work players over to the table, right? So Advantage Play Three Card Fury is the only three card variant, which there are many of, that players actually get four cards to make their best three card hand, and the dealer only gets three. So even we all know we're going to get the edge back somewhere along the way in the math, it gives the players that great feel of actually for once having an advantage over the house and where it kind of came to me is if you remember the original four card poker where the dealer got six and players got five i always lost to the extra card for the dealer so it always pissed me off 
and like let's try to you know flip that over and put it in the player's favor it took forever to make the math work but it did and by doing that it actually has a 67.67 percent hit rate so i call it like a penny slot effect where even though players aren't winning significant amounts on most most hands they're getting something back and allows them to have time on device increase and gives them that value for their dollar where they're having a good time opposed to just getting cleaned out in five hands on other games which which can happen let me make that clear like in any game we always know gambling is gambling but you have to have that little hook to really lure people in so ap3 card theory it's like oh wait, i get four cards to deal against three that's great what's the cash you have to place this required bonus wager though it's not that bad i'm like that's the game you get your four, make your best three. Dealer gets three. If you win, you win. If you hit the pay table, you hit the pay table. That's simple. I want to play it. I love that because me and my my sisters are a Thanksgiving tradition. We used to go to Tahoe all the time. Was sit down and play Pie Gal because that was the game that let us play the longest, get our free drinks, we just kind of hang out and chat. And it sounds like this three card fury may be our our next uh, our next game. Yeah, and that's the thing. Is like I love well, when I'm not getting beaten up. I love Pagao for that reason. It's like that one unit bet, maybe with a dragon bonus or a progressive. I'm sitting there having fun. I'm pushing like what 40 percent of the time, and on on AP three card theory, it's 25 percent push. But like you said, you have that possibility of hitting big Pagao. You know, just the one to one winners. But with the required with the required side wager and advantage play three card theory, at any given time, you could still hit up to that 500 to one winner while you're still getting that extended time on device. So it's it's exciting and just players hitting that beat the dealer because they got that extra card feels nice to be the dealer 67 of the time in my opinion i hate losing to the dealer everybody does. <laughs> <laughs> so if somebody wants to play three card fury is it in the world right now is there a place they can go to play it and if if not where can they play it online so online it's simple you can actually well if you want to just play for fun you can go to three the number three card theory.com it'll take you to my website in the game demo you can play for free for hours no login or anything like that so it's just fun that's how i market the game right now it's still at eagle mountain casino out in porterville i don't know if it's going to survive covid they just shut down for the second time thanks to covid and everything so you can understand things are a little tough out there and right before covid actually i was we were primed to enter six different jurisdictions we were going to go into washington state wisconsin Mississippi, back into Nevada, California problems and California tribals. And then, unfortunately, I'll say as a joke, the zombies came and kind of put a stop to everything. Um, so we're hoping once this kind of subsides and hopefully the vaccines come out, you know, and everything gets under control, that some of those prospects will come back and we'll get the game, we'll get the game back out there and get those contracts signed and ready to go. Because as you can understand for me, I've been doing this for 12 years. I finally have this hot product that was gaining traction and all of a sudden, a global pandemic like you gotta be kidding <laughs> i mean i couldn't believe that would happen granted people have it worse than me you get what i'm saying i'm sure oh i absolutely get it yep we've uh yeah we're feeling the pain too our our business is heavily uh sending players on cruises and okay. those aren't sailing right now so we feel your pain it's it's no fun and we need the zombies to go away really quick yeah fingers crossed that they go away fast so we'll see <laughs> Well, Brent, this was super interesting, and I really appreciate you taking out time to, to talk with me. Is there anything we didn't cover, anything um, I forgot to ask you? No, I don't think so. Um, I think it's pretty much in a nutshell explains the process a little bit. If I miss things, anybody could reach out to me. If you want to email me through the website, I'm happy to answer questions. If you ever want me back on for specific things, I'm happy to answer them. But there's a, obviously, this conversation can go on for hours, of course, as you can imagine. But in a nutshell, that's kind of the process. There's a lot of pitfalls to worry about. Maybe the one thing is when you go into a facility, you have a game on the floor, just be prepared to some of the stuff that you're going to hear from staff and players because it's not always going to be nice. I literally got yelled at by players because they didn't like my procedures because the dealer got their cards first. And we all know some players think that shufflers are rigged. So you can imagine what was being yelled at me because of those things. <laughs> you just got to be open-minded, be ready for change, and just don't be bogged into I can't accept any negative feedback. You got to be ready for all sorts of feedback because that will actually help you grow and change your games and make your products better overall. Well, Brent, thank you again. I wish you the best of luck with Three Card Fury. I can't wait to play it. I hope it's somewhere I can uh, access soon. And uh, anyway, thank you again for your time, Brent. We'll, we'll do it again soon. Hey, I appreciate you for having me on again, Craig. I appreciate it much.